Hi everyone, my name is Chris Varney. I'm founder and CEO of the ICANN Network. Today you're joining a webinar called Embracing Neurodiversity, a conversation among friends. I'm really, really stoked to be here with Yen Perkis and with Steve Silberman. I will introduce their good selves in a second. I just wanted to start with uh, an Aboriginal acknowledgement of country. So just want to acknowledge their traditional owners of the land and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. This webinar is occurring during Autism Acceptance Month. So Autism Acceptance Day is on the 2nd of April. Um, in talking about neurodiversity, I'm very aware that we're just scratching the surface of a very vast topic. So I apologise if you're joining this and it, it doesn't necessarily cover in depth the theme that you might have been drawn to here, but we will do our absolute best. And you're in great company with Yen and Steve. Uh, just to um, share, I am, um, yeah, very lucky to know Yen. Yen has, is an autistic author, presenter, um, commentator and thought leader, has published six books on autism on a whole range of different themes um, and a well-respected public speaker and community leader. I don't think there is an autism organisation that hasn't worked with Yen. Yen has, is also in a, their everyday life uh, actually works for the Department of Education in Canberra. So Yen is a, as a terrific thought leader on several topics. Uh, Steve Silverman is an, yeah, has had quite a life. It's amazing. An award-winning science writer whose 2015 masterpiece, Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity, is the critically acclaimed prize-winning bestseller that has changed the public discourse on autism. Wow. Steve wow. has a very significant, so, yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> You've done, yeah, it's, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, Thank you. Steve has a very significant social media following and uh, I, yeah, I'm part of that following and it, it's, um, it's, it's great. Steve's feed is always interesting and important and relevant. All right. Uh, what I thought we might do, um, one of our traditions that I can network in our mentoring sessions in primary and secondary schools with all areas of the spectrum is to ask our mentees to share some good news, something positive that might have happened over their weekend, in their lives, anything. Um, would anyone, um, just to kind of prompt us to share good news, I might start. I've had a, a lovely weekend with my little baby boy who is nine and a half months, about to, about to turn 10 months, which is, yeah, just moves so quickly. So um, parenthood has been a, a huge learning curve. So I, that's my good news. It's been a great weekend. Um, can we go next to Yen? Yen, what's some good news for you? Uh, some good news for me is that I'm um, one of a team of two people writing a screenplay based on my autobiography and it's going really well. We're up to 45 pages and um, I mean, these things, you have to get a producer and stuff before it gets made, so there's no foregone conclusion, but it's a lovely thing to do, and it's really opened my mind to a lot of perspectives that I hadn't considered before, plus it's lots of fun. Oh, wow. how exciting. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. So, uh, my good news, I have to be a little bit circumspect about it, um, but I'm actually, I'm working on another book. Um, it's not about autism. This is, by the way, the first time that I've ever said that in public. So yes, I'm working on a book after Neurotribes. Um, it's not on autism, and it's not for some interesting reasons, some of which have to do with autistic representation, mm. because I did not want to overstay my welcome as a neurotypical mm. ally. Mm. Um, I am writing about medical history, but it's a very, very different uh, condition, although like autism, it's a condition that was overlooked, ignored, uh, you know. So this is, it's another community of people where the world needs to think about how uh, these people are being treated and what they're facing. Um, but it's not about neurodiversity or autism. So I'm actually kind of plunging forward into this completely new territory for me, and it's it's very exciting. It feels like I'm doing something worthwhile and I'll, I'll probably be announcing what it's about in the next couple of weeks. Wow. Sounds, wow. What a, so I think for the listeners, you get an insight into these two. They are 
yeah, they're always pushing the frontier with new material and new content. So it's going to be a very rich discussion. So just to kick off, um, I guess, Yen, I wanted to ask you the first question because um, we've got some language that has brought this webinar together, frames like neurodiversity and the neurodiversity movement. Um, and then I know in ICANN network where we use neurodiversity and in our in our 80 plus mentoring programs, we refer a lot to autistic pride, which is really the, that's really the kernel of our mentoring framework. Uh, and autism acceptance is the, you know, the frame that is the next month over April. Are you happy to take us through these terms um, and just kind of give the listeners some brief definitions of them? Massive question for you. Uh, certainly, Chris, thank you. Um, so neurodiversity is the idea, and it's not just an idea, it's actually a biological fact, that everybody's brains are wired differently. So everyone has a different kind of brain. Um, and with autism, that forms the idea of neurodiversity, so it's not a typical brain. And there's other things within neurodiversity emergence, which is about mm. like ADHD and dyslexia, where people aren't autistic, but they're neurodivergent. But when you talk about the neurodiversity movement, that's very different. So neurodiversity is a biological fact. We all have a differently wired brain. The neurodiversity movement takes that forwards into a position that says people with a different brain are not less. So the idea of different, not less, comes directly from that idea of neurodiversity. And the idea of different, not less, is a really key thing for autistic people because for generations we've been treated like we're wrong, we're broken, our experience is not real, all of those things. So when you come into the idea of different, not less, you challenge that view. And from that, you get the concept of autistic pride, which is where people who are neurodivergent and are autistic are proud to be who we are. And that's a really important thing for autistic people. And it's a counter to all the negativity that goes on in the world, of which there is a lot. Wow, that was so great that I, I wish I could oh, give you a standing ovation. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that was an awesome that was, animation. That was a terrific summary. All right, so that was very punchy. No pressure, Steve. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, in your, um, so NeuroTribes, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the story. You, you have this moment, you're on a cruise, you meet some autistic advocates, and then that triggers this um, vocation in you to put pen to paper and um, take your vast journalism skill to this topic, which needed it. I mean, I, I'll never forget um, sitting in an office in the workplace before I was in an ICANN and I had a colleague forward me your TEDx talk. And oh, wow. uh, she, I, I'll just never forget, I was like, wow, I've been waiting for a, another voice that could really talk about the history that I hadn't delved into. So um, it was there for just listeners, if this is the first time you Hearing Steve, you've got to seek out um, Steve's TED Talk. It's incredible, the history of autism. So you spent five years researching and writing Neurotripes, the book you published in August 2015, and you've continued to be a terrific ally of the autistic community for the last three and a half years. Um, can you go back to that moment when you were thinking of this? What did you originally hope to accomplish and how did, how did its scope evolve over time? Well... Don't forget that the very first time that uh, I thought about autism and wrote about autism was way back in 2001. And uh, autism back then was still considered very rare. Um, yes. It was, uh, all the talk around it was within what we would now call the medical model, where autism was considered a, a disorder and uh, even an epidemic. That was at the height of the vax anti-vaccine hysteria. And part of what motivated me to write Neurotribes was that the article that I wrote back then, The Geek Syndrome, which was the first article about autism in high-tech communities in the mainstream press, um, what really motivated me to write the book was the emails that I got from autistic people and their families and their friends and allies uh, over the next 10 years or so. It was unusual to get mail for 10 years about a magazine article. Most magazine articles are forgotten overnight. Um, but what really interested me about this mail 
a lot of which was very uh, heartbreaking, actually, was that people were dealing with a very wide range of um, sort of lack of access to services in general. So, you know, if it was a mom, she was on a waiting list to get her kid diagnosed. If it was an autistic person, he had, would, was never able to make it through a face-to-face -face interview. Uh, or perhaps another autistic person, maybe she couldn't get health care or something. So these were very simple, basic problems in human living caused by lack of access to services. Meanwhile, the whole world was becoming obsessed with autism. You know, it went from being this kind of obscure subject when I first wrote about it to like a global obsession. But the global obsession was perseverating on only one question. Do vaccines cause autism? And I thought, you know, like why are the concerns of the people who are on the front lines of autism, whether they're autistic themselves or have autistic kids or relatives, why are the concerns of the mainstream press so different and so focused on vaccines? And it struck me eventually that the reason why that was, was that no one had ever explained the undeniably steep rise in autism diagnoses in the early 1990s. It was, you know, if you looked at, you know, anti-vaxxer websites where they all had this, you know, alarming graph. It's like, well, what happened? What, you know, and I never read, you know, I never read an article that adequately explained it. And so if you read the New York Times or some other, you know, very high level newspaper, they would say, the reason why autism diagnoses have increased in recent years is a mystery. It's a puzzle. It's a mystery. And I thought, why is it such a bloody puzzle? Like, don't we have, you know, scientists working on this? And so I plunged into researching autism history to figure out sort of where things went awry. And that was when I started to find out about, you know, that Hans Asperger had thought that autism was common, whereas Leo Connor went on to become famous as the discoverer of autism even though Asperger and his colleagues had discovered it previously, thought it was rare and all the social dynamics that fed into that. And that's basically what my book is about. But it was the need to explain to people who were really suffering from false explanations what really happened. Great. Wow. Well, thank you. I guess so. Uh, Thanks. Thank you for... To, to, for doing the book like it has made uh yeah a huge watershed moment in, for the movement really incredible so where i think for the listeners you can you would all be aware that there's a lot of misconceptions and myths about mm -hmm. autism uh and i think you've picked up in steve's explanation of the reason he did the book um that there's a lot of things he's heard going but hang on and that's called him to then um bring out that terrific book. Um, next question is really for Yen. Yen, as you do a lot of public presentations advoc and advocacy work, what are some of these myths and misconceptions that you've encountered? Oh, that's, I mean, there's myths around autism itself um, and there's myths around representation. So I, I get that thing sometimes where someone will say, you don't speak for my autistic child. And I always say, well, no, I don't, because I only really speak for myself. And if people draw parallels from my experience to theirs, that's fantastic. But I cannot speak on behalf of another person. But the assumption is that I'm high functioning and I hate those mm. labels and they're a huge assumption around autism. They're actually used by a lot of clinicians as a shorthand and they seem to be on the surface to be very useful, but actually they're very misleading and very unhelpful. So the people that get the high functioning label will not be able to access support. They'll be considered, well, you should be able to do it yourself because you're high functioning. Mm. And considered low functioning um, have no expectations on what they can do. So everything that is expected of them is really low and oh well you won't be able to do it so that becomes both of those becomes 
a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's really unhelpful. And they are not a part of the diagnostic literature. These are things that have been added on. And you find that a lot with autism is that there's things that aren't actually scientifically described or anything, they're, they're myths, but they're seen as part of autism. Um, and I could go into these at length. But if you talk about autistic pride, there are also a lot of myths around that, and misconceptions. One of them is that it's saying that autistic people don't have issues. It's saying that our lives are just perfect, mm -hmm. all blissfully autistic, and yay, go everyone. But that's not really true because nobody has a particularly easy life. Being human is difficult. And being autistic in a world that is not generally very respectful or understanding of autistics is very difficult. So you can have as much autistic pride as you like. It doesn't stop those difficulties happen, but it helps you be better able to manage them if you like and value yourself. And that goes to resilience as well. Some people say that autistic pride is against parents. There's that dichotomy, that false dichotomy that what's of interest to an autistic person is not of interest to their neurotypical parents. And that's also a total myth. I wrote a piece um, last year called A Parent's Guide to Autistic Pride, and it is all about how autistic pride can benefit the whole family and can be a real positive. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that it alienates autistic people from other people. This is not true. Could you imagine somebody who's proud of their identity, say, for belonging to a particular cultural group? Does that alienate them from other people? Of course it doesn't. Autistic pride is actually a real positive and helps us value ourselves as we are, which is great. Um, and the idea that it's nonsense. I had somebody once, or say a comment on a blog that I posted, oh, more of that neurodiversity rubbish. Now I found that quite insulting because to me neurodiversity is about my very existence and my very identity as an autistic person. But that myth that this is not true because autism is just pain and hardship. And that's really important to get away from all of those views. And the one that I'll finish with for this is, is about, um, you know, some of those what you call microaggressions when people say things which are not true and which are actually quite hurtful, but they don't realise it. So when they say things like, oh, but we're all on the spectrum somewhere or, oh, but you don't look autistic. And people, neurotypical people check that. If you're saying those things, be aware of the impact those might have on autistic people because we're not all on the spectrum somewhere. It's a bit like being a little bit pregnant. And I've yet to work out what autistic looks like. Brilliant. Right. I, I, I want to add something to that. Uh, there's something in my book that rarely gets noticed, but it's really important and very relevant to the question of, is autistic pride against parents? Something I want to point out is that back originally when the autism parents movement started, what they were working for primarily was accommodations in education and housing, changing the laws so that the world would be a better place for their kids to grow up into. And it was really only after the uh, anti-vaccine stuff started and the cure stuff started. There, you know, whenever anyone says, why are you against a cure for autism? Well, there are a million answers to that, but one of them is there isn't one. You know, there's no more cure for autism than there's a cure for my homosexuality. It's just who I am. And what happened after the anti-vaccine stuff started and the cure stuff started was that parents came to think that the best thing they could do for their kids was to work for a cure. And I think that was a huge, terrible, blind alley into which they were led by quacks. And one of the things that really impressed me about researching the early days of the autism parents movement was how devoted to providing support and accommodations it was. And, you know, if you think, well, where were the autistic adults back then? The adults couldn't get a diagnosis. Yeah. So it was not unreasonable for parents to be speaking for their autistic children because they were the only autistic people there were in the eyes of the medical establishment was the kids. So now that there are, you know, plenty of autistic adults to represent themselves, Obviously, autistic adults should be speaking for themselves and leading the community in its desire for, uh, you know, really self-expression and uh, better support and accommodations. And their autistic people's voices should be centered rather than parents. But um, I do think that there is a side of parents that is not involved in, uh, you know, being against vaccines and 
wishing for a cure, that can be tapped into that is really the historical roots of the autism parents movement and would, would make them natural allies for autistic people who are seeking support and accommodations. I think that's really important. And I do find these days that things have changed with the parent group and that parents tend to be quite good, good allies, good support yeah. for their kids. And it's very, and I've had to change my thinking because I remember when I started out in 2005, yeah. parents were a really, it's a tricky topic because they were quite, you know, there's a lot of difficulties there and a lot of assumptions about autism that weren't very helpful and not listening mm -hmm. to autistic adults. But these days, it's very, very different. And of course, there still are those parents who have those issues. But a lot of the time, the parents I talk to are pretty much on the same page with me, which is fantastic. Absolutely. It is, it is changing a lot. Just, um, we're going to now move into a focus on allies. Uh, I guess I just wanted for the listeners. Um, I'm very, I'm very aware that the myths um, and myth busting really is the paradigm we're in because the myths do have a lot of impact on the next generation um, growing up with autism. Uh, our program works with 1,500 kids and teenagers and young adults on the autism spectrum, and and the beginning of a mentoring program, like most programs, go for three to four years, but in a school. Um, at the beginning, most 13, 14 year olds are ashamed of their autism and um, join the program through a lot of coaxing from their parents or teachers. And the, there's an overwhelming fear of the program being disclosed to their peers. So it's a, um, my life is sometimes tricky. Like I see on Facebook, uh, you know, great stories of people with autistic pride, but then in, in the day job of I Can Network in schools, you are, you are seeing the cold face where it's still not safe to disclose that you're autistic in, in schools and in workplaces, by extension. It's, it's becoming safer, but it, it's still not safe. Um, there are some fantastic examples where I've seen um, through a good three-year mentoring process, some autistic uh, students... Uh, you know, run a Kahoot quiz in, to their year level assemblies where they run a, you know, what is autism survey and seeing um, incredible attitudinal cultural change occur in their year level when a main, you know, just any student hears a, a peer of theirs say, I'm autistic and I'm proud of that and it helps me do X, Y, Z. I've got a great memory in these areas. Um, these are some of my issues I might have at school. This is how you can help me. Um, and that is just a tremendous thing that, um, that myself and my 29 autistic colleagues are very lucky to see. Uh, now, we might now go to, you know, thinking about allies in more depth. So I guess just to frame it for people, um, there's lots of ways to describe an ally. I know my mate, Tim, who grew up with me, he was a terrific ally of mine. Uh, he probably wouldn't necessarily identify with the term ally. He's just my friend. But um, there are like allies is a is a frame that's within our movement that describes people who are very supportive of autistic people, whether it's their child, their friend, etc. So, Yen, can I ask you what does a good ally look like? Oh, there's, uh, I actually wrote a blog post about this too a, a while back. So um, I, I came up with quite a list of things that it makes a good ally. Um, so listen to autistic people as a matter of course, and that's really important. If you're supporting people, you need to know their perspectives. You need to be listening to them. And I, I had somebody, I said to someone once, oh, gee, I worry that I'll turn into some dreadful, arrogant person and all of that. And they said, you, you only will if you stop listening. And I think that listening is so important. And when people mm -hmm. come from a group that faces discrimination, being heard is, is absolutely essential. Um, recognising that the role of an ally is a support role and is not the leading role. And I think sometimes you meet people who want to take everything over and, you know, oh, well, this is me. Well, that's not really helpful in this space. You need to actually be there 
as a supporter. And I think Steve's a real um, example of, of a good ally as well um, with that kind of approach, which is fantastic. One of the other things I notice about good allies is that they don't think they're good allies. So you find a really positive ally, they will say, oh, no, I don't think I'm doing this right. And that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's game changer. If someone yeah. says that, if that's their approach, well, they're prob they're, they are probably someone you actually do want as an ally. Um, not making it all about them and that, you know, oh, I've been, I'm so good for doing these things. That's not a good ally. And respecting that autistic people are the experts on being autistic. And I'm talking about that with Kristen before when we were just logging on. Um, the, important, the importance of knowing that when we're talking about autism, the experts about autism are going to be autistic people every single time. That's not to say there isn't a place for allies or for researchers doing good research and things like that or clinicians. But if you want to know about autistic experience, you talk to autistic people. Um, and I've got a friend who's a parent and absolutely exemplifies allies. Um, she initially brought into some of that really unhelpful thinking that autistic kids need to be fixed. You know, you need to make autistic kids look autistic and she brought into that but then she realized that wasn't helpful and now she places so much value on listening to autistic people and does some really great work in the community so I guess she's an example of someone who's gone from uh, a difficult perspective to a really helpful one and it's just lovely and it takes a lot of courage to um, you know to understand that you've done something unhelpful yes there's a cat behind me um and um and actually rectify that so i really admire people that can do that mm. thank you very much yen um now to so yen referred to how steve joining us here is a great example of an ally steve take us back to so 2001 when you um really turn your mind to this and turn your skill to it what advice would you give to other people with a more typical brain um, in terms of how they can help? Well, I thought Yen said it really beautifully. Mm -hmm. And um, there was definitely a moment um, that was crucial for me when um, Ari Niemann of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network suggested that the first thing I do to do research for neurotribes was to go to Autreat, which was an autistic retreat organized by and for autistic people. So it was the first time I had ever been in a neurological minority. Um, it did remind me of when I was gay and closeted in high school, but um, you know, I basically hung out with about 70 autistic people of all different ages uh, for several days. And it was, it was, a like a shower that washed off a lot of the mist that I had. And I'll actually give you a, a, ver a very clear example of that. You know, I, I, before that, I had been reading, you know, science books on autism. That's what one reads, you know, for, you know for, uh, and if one is a science writer writing about autism, you know. So um, one of the things that I had read was that autistic people don't get humor. Satire confuses them, you know? So I thought, oh, okay, I don't get humor. So I go to Autry and um, Ari had just been uh, appointed to the National Council on Disability by President Obama, who we much miss, by the way. Um, and uh, so Ari walked into the room uh, and there were like 70 autistic people there. And a young woman in the back of the room said, Ari, we love you. If we were capable of feeling such an emotion, and so I instantly knew that, uh, in fact, autistic people can do satire really well. Um, and there were, there were many myths that I lost uh, by, by being an autry. And when I came back to start writing my book, I started writing some description of, you know, what is autism? I started writing it well, it's you know, social impairments, blah, blah, blah. And I started, and I, you know, I just, I practically slapped myself. I was actually sitting in this chair and I thought, Steve, you just were with those people for nearly a week. They're not like this. Just get rid of that inherited stereotyping language. What were they like? They were complex, rich, beautiful, funny, you know, empathetic human beings. And so I sort of dropped the 
whole burden of all these stereotypes and all these myths and then try to write about autistic people seeing them with fresh eyes in a way you could say and so that was a big moment when i think i sort of became an ally and i mean i didn't think of it that way and I, I do think that ally is a word um it's a praise word one shouldn't apply it to oneself it should be applied to you by someone else you know so i don't i never say oh i'm an ally you know but i think that was the moment when i started to write with a sense of social justice, not just a sense of, oh, I'm writing about this interesting science topic. Wow. Wow. It sounds, Autry sounds so similar to ICANN camps and the oh, first yeah. one we ever ran, which was for 35 autistic young adults in Gembrook, Victoria, which was just a huge weekend, but amazing. I've never felt people at the end of that camp just talked about, I've never felt like I belonged this much in my life or I've never felt so accepted. And when people experience that university, that, that feeling of acceptance, they are, oh, they can do anything. It's such a wonderful gift you can give someone. I, I must say I had such a great time hanging out at ICANN. It was just <laughs> such a beautiful scene. I practically yeah. envy how much fun you yeah. must have. I know. It is. A, my life's amazing. And we all have just, yeah, it is a beautiful workplace. Yeah. The, what you watch people, how you watch them grow is oh, yeah. it's incredible. Uh, I just want to do want to talk about developments in the movement. Um, I know in 2013, when I was running around to friends I'd worked with and said, I want to start an autistic led organization. People, I had a, I had someone tell me autistic lit people, are not capable of holding corporate duties. They could never run their own business. And I was like, but you realize that I'm autistic and I'm working with other autistics and we're, we're gonna do it. And five and a half years later, we're, you know, we're lucky to be Australia's autistic led service provider with 29 autistic staff. So there are fantastic developments that are out there and you can do anything you put your mind to. Um, and I'm certainly seeing that primary schools are really they're really making some great inroads to creating autism friendly schools. Um, we've got to prioritize the work in secondary schools, in my opinion. But um, can I just ask, um, Yen, do you, um, from the, the position you hold in the movement, what are some of the developments that you're seeing that are exciting? I've seen a lot of developments. The one thing I would say is I've been doing this since 2005. So I've had a lovely opportunity to see things evolving and they really have evolved a lot. One thing that I've really noted um, is around the autistic led thing and also attitudes in society. So we had a couple of times in the last few years, we had notably a politician and a, a media personality saying some really unhelpful, nasty stuff about autism. Now, um, what happened to both of those people would not have happened a few years ago. And what happened was that not just autistic people, but everyone shot them down in flames and said, you can't say that, that's really unhelpful. Now that would not have happened even five or 10 years ago. When I gave, we've all done TED Talks as well. The three of us have all done TED Talks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I did te my TED talk, it was in 2013. And afterwards we had an after party and there was a journalist there from the Canberra Times. And um, she said, what did you speak about? And I said, I spoke about autism and resilience. And you could tell she had no frame of reference for what I just said, autism, resilience in the same sentence. It wasn't a criticism, <laughs> that's where things were at. You know, that's where things yeah. were at that time so it is lovely to see things evolving and the other thing that happened a couple of years ago SBS online uh, published a an article about neurodiversity now that mm. awesome. but the fact that I didn't know all the advocates that they quoted was even more awesome when yeah. I was doing advocacy, there was Wen Lawson Polly Samuel and some people in the US a few people in Australia and that was pretty much it as far as autistic advocates went. And I wrote a book and so I sort of default joined the group. But we all knew each other. It was, you know, it was a fairly small community, whereas now there's thousands of us. And I can only see this as a good thing from practical sense because I don't want to do all the talks because I'm, you know, I'm busy. <laughs> but 
in terms of what it means, because as I said, we don't represent anyone else, we represent ourselves. So by that logic, the more of us there are, the better, because that's more perspectives that people can relate to. And I'm very supportive of other advocates joining the, the whole thing. And I think it's so important, and that is an evolution, that advocacy mm -hmm. is not the domain of a privileged few anymore. Yes. It's the domain of everybody, including children. We have eight and nine and 10 year olds who are doing extremely good work. Yeah, yeah and, we do. That's my, obs my, I could observe on this for a long time, but that's my main observations about how things have developed and are developing. You put it so well. Thank you so much. Um, we will need to um, wrap up because um, some of us have timing, have other commitments. Can I, um, can I just ask very briefly, um, so this video is being developed and will be shared in the spirit of um, promoting autism acceptance and celebration of autistic pride and autistic strengths. Uh, on the flip side, we know that April, for a whole range of reasons, can be distressing um, for autistic people. Uh, would you, um, yeah, I should have said many autistics, sorry, um, can be distressing for many autistics. Yen, would you be happy to share why it can be distressing for many autistic people? Oh, definitely. Um, April is a month that was sort of given to us, presumably without a lot of consultation, and it was very well-meaning, I think. The idea was we'll promote autism awareness, surely that's a good thing, in, in April. But the problem is if you unpick awareness, it's, very, it's not very useful, it's kind of meaningless. A bully is aware that their victim is different, so they've got awareness. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't help. Um, so the awareness thing is a problem and it's sort of a time for a lot of unhelpful thinking around things like cures and epidemics and all of that kind of business. Um, the idea that it's tragic, it's a burden. And this is only just being addressed, this thinking. Um, and it is being addressed, which is good. So I, I contacted an organisation I do some work with a few weeks ago and I said, look, if you need me to do anything for April, I have some availability. And I was absolutely delighted at their response. It's a mainstream organisation. They said, we were actually thinking of doing something for Autistic Pride Day on June the 18th. And I'm like, well... That makes me extremely happy. Um, so th that kind of thing, that knowledge and the, the radical stuff becomes the mainstream. And this is a lovely thing we're seeing, but autism can be really difficult. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> autism April, I should say, can be really difficult. Oh dear, Freudian slip, whoops. Um, so yes, autistic people are generally not keen on April for those reasons. And it can become quite problematic. And there's campaigns that people have issues with, like the blue thing. And, and then there's that mismatch in people thinking they're being lovely and inclusive, when in reality, they're doing things that just make us cringe. So it, I guess the main issue is it throws into quite sharp relief. Um, some of those issues within the understanding of autism. It throws them into sharp relief and you sort of have to deal with them. And I think most people um, on the spectrum can really struggle with, with that. Um, so it is a funny thing. It's something that was done for us. And if you do things for us, it's not such a good idea to do things with or alongside us, I suppose. Well said. Thank you, Yen. All right, so Steve, now to you. I, I know you've signed the Autism Acceptance Month pledge, and um, yeah, you can. Would you mind telling us a bit more about the pledge and what sort of events you have coming up during this month? Um, for our viewers who might not be well connected to autistic writers or video bloggers, would you would you also mind sharing us a few of your favourites that you see around? Oh, sure. Um, the pledge was to not center uh, neurotypical voices, really, in uh, discussion of autism. And so one of the things that I have tried to do is to do events whenever I can, when I'm in control of the event, to yeah. center autistic voices. And so, for instance, I just tweeted uh, a few minutes ago, on April 10th, I'm going to be talking in San Francisco at the headquarters of a company called Square that does online payments. Uh, I'm going to be talking to an LGBT uh, uh, autistic self-advocate named John Marble, who I like very, very much. And it's not like he's interviewing me or something. It's like we're having a conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about that because it was sort of a grassroots effort put together by the Neurodiversity 
uh, group at Square. I'm seeing a lot more of these mm. groups emerging in big companies, which is wonderful. Just self-organized uh, nerd mailing list of neurodivergent people. And I'm getting asked to talk uh, by those groups more. Um, I'm also in, uh, I'm doing a bunch of stuff in England. It's not in April, but in May and June, I'm gonna be appearing at several uh, events. One of the ones that I'm most excited about is a, an event put together by Autistic UK, which is the first autistic led organization in England. Um, so we're gonna be doing a thing in Manchester where there are gonna be a bunch of autistic advocates uh, talking that day. I will also talk. Um, I'm also going to do a thing at a, uh, an event called the Festival of Debates in Sheffield with uh, an autistic woman who calls herself Miss Tot on Twitter. Um, I'm also going to be doing a thing with other neurodivergent people, people with uh, Tourette syndrome, actually, uh, in, in Warwick, I think it's pronounced, yeah. Warwick Downs. Um, and so what I'm doing now that I, now that sort of the, the, you know, the main stuff about my book is over and I have more control over the events, uh, I'm, do, I'm trying my best to center neurodivergent voices. Wow. I'm actually joining you in the by video for the Autistic UK one. They asked me oh, to do a five to 10 minute video about the future of autism. So I'm looking Fantastic. forward to joining you in virtual. You, but we'll be in the same spot. That's yeah, yeah. great. That's so good. Wow. That's um yeah. That's a huge three months ahead for both of you. Uh, yeah. Our campaign at I Can Network Humans on the Autism Spectrum will be running across April. That's it's where we showcase the stories of a whole broad range of autistic people, um, young and old, um, of all different walks of life. And it's a, yeah, it's a special campaign. My hard highlight in that campaign is seeing the students we work with profiled because it is such a, an amazing moment for them sharing their autism with the world. And uh, yeah, they are, um, yeah, uh, they're, they're the people that I, um, that I re am really walking with. So I'm, I'm very excited about that campaign. So you can just see that at our website, icannetwork.com.au forward slash humans. And it starts on April 1. All Great. right, we have finished. All right, can I just, um, did either of you have any closing thoughts you would like to share? Yes, I love you both a lot. You both are amazing and beautiful and very much an inspiration to me. Thank Thanks. you, Steve. I'd like to thank the ICANN Network for hosting this event because I, I, I can't speak for Steve, but I've really enjoyed this conversation. It's really useful. Yeah, it has been a lovely moment. Um, and just acknowledging my colleague, Kristen, who has put in so much hard work to making this webinar happen. Absolutely. And hopefully it would be lovely if we could do an in-person event together. Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Future. Definitely. Who knows? I'm sure that will happen. Uh, yeah. Can we just um, thank all our listeners for joining? We hope you found this helpful um, and keep walking with us. We'll keep building this neurodiversity movement, autistic pride, neurodivergence. Thank you again. Okay. We'll, we'll end it there. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.